All right, what is wrong with bioinformatics? Let's start with that. I'm following up on Chris. <laughs> Most code is badly written in C and C++ today. Um, Perl was there for a while, as Chris pointed out, on the bio, with the BioPerl paper. I'm on the BioRuby paper, you know, that's what we did. Um, Python has been there ever since Perl sort of faded away. Um, and now the you know, new cool kid on the blo block is uh, Rust. What is wrong with these people? It's not so much wrong. They're different, right? I mean, why, why do you start in biology? Why do you become a doctor? Yeah, it's not because you love computers. You love dogs. Oh. You know, and this is not what it looks like for them. Yeah, this is, this is not the normal. The normal is us. To us, right? So, uh, you know, you study biology because you love people, right? You love the horses. You love dogs, cats, birds, butterflies, insects, snakes, and dragons, right? That's a picture of a nematode. Um, I think the title was uh, Nematode Teeth. You cannot see the nematode with a naked eye. It's the uh, most successful species on the planet. Uh, multicellular species, I should say. Um, and, you know, that's a microscopic image. They're not real teeth. Can't be, right? And we are working on the tree of life, right? It's kind of like an abstract syntax tree, right? And um, is it a dependency graph? You tell me. But I think it's a left brain versus right brain kind of thing. You know, that, that's the difference for biologists, why they're not so adaptable to our ideas in general. Some are, you know, a small subset. So why are we here today to discuss functional programming? Um, Lisp, does anyone not know Lisp here? One person? No, that's great, that's great. <laughs> it's a litmus test, you know. <laughs> Stop me if I start to talk, talk rubbish. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, this, this talk is about Python, Lisp, uh, um, Zig, right, and C. So I'm not going to say much about Lisp because everybody knows it. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to talk a little bit about Guile. And what I tell my students and the people I deal with is, you know, that if you can program, you get superpower, right? But it's a, it's a, it's a growth path, and I've, I've also, I'm going through the growth path myself. So if you look at my FOSDEM talks, so FOSDEM is, one of, is the largest, it used to be the largest open source free software conference in the world. It's in Brussels every year. It's a walking conference. They have 40 parallel, parallel tracks. You should go there if you can. It's great. So I gave a talk in 2016 saying uh, foreign packages in GNU Geeks. Anyone heard of GNU Geeks? Yeah, a few. Okay. You. <laughs> <laughs> From me. So uh, yeah, I'm counting four people, you know, and I'm interacting with them. So I suppose that's. <laughs> yeah. So it's a package management system. It's a it's a declarative uh, deployment system for software and also for services these days. And uh, um, Arun, the next speaker, may touch on that a little. So 2017, reproducible packaging and distribution of software with GNU Geeks, right? So I'm doing more and more Guile because Geeks is written in Guile. Um, in 2019, I did a talk on minimalism matters, right? I think it's very important. And then 2020 is Lisp everywhere. Guru Doom is around the corner, right? I'm getting excited. That's obvious. And then in 2023, I do Sig and Guile. Um, and actually for that talk at FOSDEM in, you know, in February, uh, I prepared two talks. You know, so I did, it, I did the first talk then, you know, and it's a really hands-on Zig and Guile uh, talk, which shows you how, you know, how you can interact with these tools and languages. Um, you, you can see it if you want, the link is there. So now I'm giving the other talk that I prepared in February. <clears throat> so, you know, learning Lisp, and, you know, I really was a Ruby guy, uh, and I have to deal a lot with Python these days. Uh, it's getting increasingly painful. Right, this snippet I just picked up from a, from a tool. Don't you love it? And then everyone is a language expert, right? So, you know, we, we started off today with a, with a language war on Racket and Guile. <laughs> uh, when you meet somebody like Andy Wingo, you just go, okay, mm, you know, really. So Andy is amazing. Uh, and he's the, really the man behind GNU Guile. And GNU Guile is a, is a scheme Lisp. 
And it came, you know, it was, if you, if you use green guile uh, some 15 years to go, uh, if, or even 10 years ago, it's a completely different animal from what it is today, right? And it's, most, it's all due to, that, to Andy. Um, Andy, you know, replaced the guile VM bytecode uh, engine, uh, introduced the just-in-time compiler. And, you know, some of that was probably driven by GNU Geeks. So GNU Geeks is a list project, and it contains, uh, today's count, uh, 912,599 lines of Lisp code. And this needs to compile, you know, in minutes. Otherwise, people won't use Geeks. So uh, that's behind that. And he introduced a really interesting uh, Fibers implementation. Um, he replaced the garbage collector this year. I think it's still a work in progress, but uh, the link is there. And then he's working uh, today on a, on a WASM WebAssembly backend. Yeah. So if, if that happens, that's that's pretty exciting. You can run uh, Guile in the browser essentially. So in my uh, Zig and Guile exploration in February, you know, um, I I just proved how easy it is to bind Guile to Zig. And this is because you know Guile was intentionally meant to uh, as a as a as a language for binding C uh, libraries. C++ libraries, if you will. Um, and Zig, Zig has a C ABI, so it's a one-on-one -on -one mapping. You know, there's no, no issue at all. It's almost too easy. Yeah, that does more things, but I'll get into that a little bit. So, since no, none of you is probably familiar, anyone familiar with Zig? No? Yes, a little bit. So I'll just show some Zig code so you get a taste for it. It suffers from the, uh, what's it called, the cancer of the semicolon? <laughs> <laughs> it's not Lisp, right? But it is, it's it's a, something you can use in addition to to Lisp. And I would say it's you know if you if you would pick C now to do something, you know you probably should look at, at Zig. So one of the things that Zig has is that it's you know it's 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 ma it's uh, memory allocation is manual. Yeah, so you can pick uh, different types of uh, of uh, gar uh, sorry of uh, memory management systems. So here's a general purpose allocator that you pick. Um, Right, it's strictly typed, so you pass in a string that that's, uh, uh, consists of characters and signs uh, bytes. And it returns here an array list. And what is interesting is that the array list uh, of integers uh, has an exclamation mark in front of it, right? And that means it's actually uh, a maybe monad. Yeah, so you, have to, you, can, you can use it to, to also return an error. So Zig uh, does not have exception handling. Um, and they do that partly because there's a penalty to it, right? Exception handling is costly. And, you know, one reason why C is still, or Fortran is faster than C++ in general is still because of the exception handling that's, handling in C, that's happening in C++. So you can disable that. Um, let's see. So you make a list, then you do some splits, right? So you can see here, actually, the if statement is, a, is an expression of sorts, right? Not a pure one as in list, but it, it, it's nice. It's nice enough. And then you get a while loop, and you pass in uh, an item, a chunk, right? And here you can see that, uh, let me see, you pass the integer here. So you have also some namespacing, which you don't have in, in, uh, in C. Yeah, so format is a, is a, is a module, and then a parseint. Um, and then we, when, you, when there's an error, you can return it as an error, right? So you can either return an error or, you know, the actual list, which you do at the end. Okay, so this is just, just a, I mean, just to get a taste of it. Some people will, you know, will puke. Others, others say, yeah, I can handle this. Just one more example is that, um, you know, a difference be with Zig, between Zig and C is that Zig tries to avoid you to shoot yourself in the foot. Um, in C, it's all too easy, also in C++. So you can, for, for example, cast from an unsigned uh, 64 integer to an, un to, to an unsigned 8 integer. But obviously, if this number is too large, then you will lose information, yeah, because it's going to be compressed into a smaller um, piece of memory, uh, and Zig will balk. Okay, so there's an intro for Zig's integer casting for C programmers. There's a link there. So what are the Zig goodies? Um, how much time have I got? 18 minutes. Okay, good. Um, so memory handling, you can choose your allocators. You can, there's also heap allocators, so you can, you can gain some performance there for, for tight loops. Um, it's got strict typing, strict casting, um, bounce checking, enforced error, error handling. You have, to, you have to handle errors, you cannot ignore them. Structs, it has support for you know, C constructs like the zero terminated string. 
Um, it does slices and in index pointers, to, you know, but in a safe way, supposedly. We have inlining. Um, there's compile time ZIG, so it doesn't have macros. They try to avoid macros at all costs, but you can, um, ra rather than the, you know, the, what is it called, the macro system that you have in C and C++, it's actually ZIG that you write that compiles at compile time into something that, uh, that can be used. And they do some nifty stuff with that. It's got introspection, probably better than most of these type of languages and an AST. Um, you can import native C headers, which I did for the Guile uh, uh, example that I, that I did in February. So I just imported Guile.h. And you could use then every function and every structure that was in there. There's support for generic data structures. Um, it has transparent vector compute in a loop. And the fun thing about this all, it's really a small language. You know, it, it fits in your head very quickly. And now what is really crazy is that it's excellent runtime and compile time performance both. It's fast, did I say that? But Zig is no Lisp, right? So it's sad, it's not functional. So tracking back a little bit, so what do I want out of a language, right, after all these years? <clears throat> I want to express myself quickly and get results fast, yeah? So I'm impatient. As a professor, I have to be impatient. I have other things to do, like writing grants. I want decent error messages, please. I want to be able to drop in a REPL and debug, right? And this is something that few bioinformaticians use today, yeah? So Python has a REPL, right? They'll tell you, but nobody uses it. Well, hardly, right? And why is that? Because it's bloody useless. And you only learn that when you start to do Lisp. You go, okay, oh, this is nice, right? Um, I want to be my code to be recognizable and readable after two years. Okay, that's, that's a nice aim. I want some stuff to be really fast at compile time. Okay, and that's why I would use SIG or C, right? Because, you know, uh, Lisp can be really fast, you know, and, 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 you know, a lot of Lispers will claim you don't need anything else, but sometimes you do. Um, and I like compile time checking when I want it, right? Because it, it holds me back. And I want few dependencies if possible. So a little bit on FP. Um, please learn FP if you haven't, and this is for the audience that might be watching online. <laughs> because it gives true insight into abstraction, state handling, side effects, declarative computing, deterministic computing, it's all there. And so, you know, I would conclude that. Um, but functional programming is not always great, right? Because CPU's underlying hardware is not functional. Yeah, it's imperative. It has sequence instructions and mutable data. And, you know, to gain performance, you will have to deal at that level at some point. Yeah, and I'm really talking about high performance stuff. So, all recursion we need, that's, that's Yoda, I think, right? Um, in a little Lisper. <laughs> Do we? I don't know. You know, it doesn't always fit my brain. Monads to avoid shared costs at, at all costs, you know? Is there any Haskellers here? I think there was, right? Yeah, so <clears throat> it's not always optimal. So sometimes you need to break out. Yeah, and that's where something like Zig comes in. Strict typing is useful. It creates faster runtimes. You know, it helps the compiler um, optimize. It helps refactoring sometimes. Um, it's kind of conservative in a, in a sense of how you program. But, you know, strict typing in general, when, I ha when I'm dealing with it, it slows me down terribly, you know. It's, 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 it's really, uh, you know, not my preferred way of programming. Um, and zealots slow me down too, right? I mean, if you talk about strict typing, some people go off on a tang tangent. <laughs> garbage collectors. Um, faster development, less mistakes, right? So garbage collectors are extreme, are a really great invention. Um, but you think, what's not to like, right? If you, if you never use, you know, but you try to bind against another language, you go, you know, you have two garbage collectors, right? And they start to interfere with each other. You go multi-threading, you know, the whole thing starts to blow up in your face. And that has happened quite a few times to me. Then you have start, stop the world issues, you know, depending on implementation. Um, so, you know, garbage collectors can be nasty. Um, yeah, and I think that's, that's where a language like Zig comes in. Is it doesn't have a garbage collector. And, and it's quite useful to bind against, you know, Lisp or, or Python or whatever. So I gave a talk on minimalism. Um, it matters. You know, when, it, when I read code, it should fit in my head. I, I, you know, I, I'm not a great coder. I mean, I've, se I've seen people who are amazing coders and they can fit a very large model in their heads of their code, right? 
Um, I, I'm not like that, so I'm, I try to keep it simple. But complex systems are also not that transparent, um, and also languages. So both Zig and Gal, as, as language implementations, are surprisingly small. They're really, really small. What is lousy software? Okay, that's gonna be that could be a long list, right? But last week, uh, the UK's air traffic system went down. I don't know if you've heard about that. Um, it was the largest out, outage in a decade because a decade ago they had a several of those, uh, and that was due to a, a computer they were using that was still from the 60s. But this is different. You know, this is new software, and whatever the reason, you know, um, 790 departures failed and 785 arrivals were cancelled. What happened to those other five planes? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so C is great, you know, and I, I've, I've been doing C from the start. It's kind of a high level assembler. It's popular, um, but yeah, you can shoot yourself in the foot so easily. C++ is less great. It's amazingly complicated language. Um, does anyone love C++? Do you know? Yes. Who? Oh, okay. Well, it's, it's, it must be a select group too. <laughs> um, but it, you know, what is really annoying, it, it, it has slow compile times, right? Uh, and that's, that's something I want to talk about a little bit. And the run times are smaller and slower than C sometimes. And then you have the elephant in the room, right? Anyone may have heard of this language that will replace all. I wanted to love it. You know, what's not to love? It's secure and fast. That's functional programming paradigm. But it pulls in compact complex dependencies. You know, it's, it's, it's a dependency graph is quite nasty. The syntax is not that beautiful. Anyone done Rust here? Looked at Rust? Yeah? You love the syntax? No. Good. <laughs> <laughs> the compiler is a dog, right? We agree? Yes, um, and it's like a nagging wife, you know, sorry, you know, for, uh, for those who will be offended by that, but <laughs> um, it's, it breaks my flow all the time, right? I really tried it. I probably have to do it still because other people are doing it, but uh, I'm not going to look forward to that. Anyone remember Turbo Pascal? Yay! <laughs> Was it great? Yes. Yeah, this, so this is late 80s. Um, and that was a real deal breaker. I thought it was a game changer. Sorry, not a deal breaker, game changer. Maybe deal breaker for others. But uh, yeah, I mean, it was amazing that the compiler could be that fast, right? And this is on a machine that is, you know, is a half a megabyte or so. Um, it was blazingly fast at the time. And Turbo, Borland, Pascal, you know, in those days was faster than what we're facing now with the tools. You think what happened in those, you know, 30 plus years. <clears throat> so I want minimalism, I want functional programming support, I want optional garbage collection, uh, I want fast interaction, REPL, fast runtime. But yeah, maybe these demands are a little bit conflicting in the language, right? So maybe we end up with two languages, you know, by, uh, by design. Um, this is a nice blog post, you can check that uh, on, uh, on why, uh, you know, Ruby and Perl are extremist lab liberal. Um, it's, it's, it's fun read. Um, this, is a, this is a post on uh, memory safety approaches as slow down development velocity, right? Development velocity. I think that's quite interesting. It's you know it's, it's obviously about Rust. Um, so let's talk a little bit about scheme, Gauss scheme, because uh, people here know, who uses Gauss scheme here, Arun? Yeah. Okay. Great. Really. Okay. So Gauss has come a long way. Um, you know, it has a garbage collector, it has a REPL, it's minimalistic. Um, and it has really good C bindings, yeah? So, <clears throat> I really like it. You know, I did, I did a stretching racket. I didn't enjoy it that much. Zig, meanwhile, is a minimalistic language. Um, it's, it's really focused on performance. Um, it's, you know, it gives this Turbo Pascal type feeling. I think it uh, can replace C++ also in places. It has, it has enough uh, to do that. Um, Yeah, so for low-level performance, you know, you could, you could consider it. How much time have I got left? Oh, okay, I'm ahead. 
because I got two more slides. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, just a note on deployment. So package management, right? Packaging of software. So every, every language today is starting to think about how can we package our software because their users you know, the, are demanding it, right? Rust, part of Rust's popularity, I think, is because it, you know, it's this ecosystem where um, they build their own package managers. So it's really easy. You know, everybody tells me it's so easy to use Rust. Um, so the language I, I mentioned here, you know, C and C++ don't really have package managers, right? Garl doesn't have a proper pa package manager. Um, what does it mean? Python is a strange case because it has many package managers, but none of them really, you know, very useful. So, so they ended up with a sort of, uh, you know, uh, something that had to work for everyone, and, and you know, it's, it's actually not that bad. And Zig, in their uh, wisdom, has also started on the package manager. Um, Whatever you choose to do with a package manager, don't don't make it into an ecosystem, you know, because you always have to bind against other languages. You know, you cannot you cannot isolate yourself from the dependency graph. And so, so if you live just in a, in in one world of package management, you're going to make it really hard for your users to break out of that. Um, most package managers, you know, don't handle dependencies well, as we know. They ought to be det deterministic. What does it mean? You know, there there should be no circular dependencies, right? Well, in GNU Geeks, we have to package things, and package managers that are circular are really problematic for us, and that includes NPM, it includes Rust Cargo, um, it includes Racket, Racket's package manager, I forgot the name. Yeah, so, so they, they're really, really problematic for uh, making deterministic deployments. And in fact, you don't need a package manager because we have GNU Geeks, you know, and, and, and the C and C++ world has always proven that we actually don't need a package manager if you just, you know, use the um, the proper package manager to come with the distribution. So I, th I think that, uh, you know, bioinformatics and many applied sciences will remain a mess from a computer science pr perspective, right? But we can, we can grow up a little, right? And we can, we can, we can you know, grow up together uh, or grow towards each other, you know, because I'm really impressed by some of you. Yeah, so I'm that little guy, Spider-Man, you know, even though it failed. Um, when a language aims to solve it all, it gets complex, slow, and, lo and lose interactivity and break the flow, right? And I'm talking about Rust here, I guess. Um, and, you know, it, it, is a, it is a slow compiler, and because it's doing a lot of work, yeah, it's, it's doing a lot of work uh, uh, inferencing, you know, what, what is happening with, uh, with the source code, uh, I don't think it will get better. It will, it will probably get worse. Yeah, so my personal first choice is to program in Guile and Zig instead of uh, Python, C, C++, or Rust. And then the final line is that I would like to um, gratefully acknowledge support from the NIH um, because we have uh, a software project from the NIH. Yeah? So it's been running for a few years now. Um, and it's really delightful that, uh, um, that the funding agencies realize we actually have to invest in software. Yeah, so, and that's... that's it's quite a, it's, you know, it's quite a leap from 10 years ago, believe me. And then we have the NSF award for building a, a RISC-V supercomputer with a million cores, yeah, which probably doesn't impress anyone, but uh, <laughs> I think it's cool. Thank you. So I want, to, I want to start by saying that this is the first time I've ever seen a presentation fully done in the command line. I'm sure that I might, I'm probably the only one in the room that can say that, but I, it's, it blew me away. Um, and I uh, appreciate your talk about the funding. I'll talk a little bit about funding the translator program later on and why, um, at least at NCATS, we think that funding software programming is really important. Um, one thing that was really interesting to me was... Um, it, like it, this seems like par part of what you're presenting here is something that you show to your students to to you know tell them, you know why are we doing this? Why does bioinformatics exist? I guess my question is how do they receive this kind of information? I, I was a Perl lover myself, and being told that Perl is dead, I, I was never actually told that until until just now, and that's very <laughs> that, that's that's devastating to me. So I'm curious what how how your students react to like this idea that. Languages essentially die off and are being replaced by other ones. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Uh, 
Well, Pearl is dead. I'm so, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's called Rakudo now, but uh, <laughs> it's yeah, it's become a different animal, and they lost somewhere the, the the popularity. I think they became more functional. By the way, you know, that's that's an interesting development. They they tried to be hard to become more functional programming language, and and the, and the first implementation of Rakudo was I think in Haskell, if I remember correctly. Um, but yeah, uh, how do my students react? Um, yeah. I think I think it's, you know we we are mostly using Python for a lot of the work. You know that's kind of the default in bioinformatics. Um, but but I, I can point out where where Python is problematic, and um, you know we we also introduce Lisp so they get to see how you, how you can do other things. You know so they open their eyes, I could say. You know, uh, <clears throat> but um, yeah, I, you know I think I agree with Chris. You know that with most people they are on a on a on a, on a growth path somewhere, right? And you have to go through all the steps to really, you know, start to appreciate what it means. Um, and uh, yeah, you can't force that. Not really. Yeah, I, ca I cannot tell, tell someone, you know, you should do this in Lisp. <laughs> They'll hate me, <laughs> right? So, so I think, uh, yeah, it, it's it's something that grows over time, yeah, and, and you just have to live with that. But I think uh, you know next year there's uh, ICFP is in Italy in Milano. I just checked. Yeah, so we should do another room <laughs> and maybe double the audience. You know, and uh, and there's some, some some functional programs in Europe too. You know, and maybe maybe we could also uh, you know uh, involve the Rust community because they 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 do do functional programming. Yeah, even at macros. You know, so yeah. and then I'll be less uh, you know loud about it. <laughs> Yeah.